Thank you for bringing the church into the room. I'm glad you're here. And uh, thank you for joining us if you are uh, watching from home. Uh, we hope that you're able to uh, worship along with us. Let's start with a song. This one's called Thy Mercy, My God. Feel free to, to stand, and, and we'll turn on the lights a little bit if that's okay. And um, make yourself at home. Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the book. the covenant love of thy crucified son. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seeks mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. seated. We are glad you're here. Thank you for bringing the church into the room. I uh, wanted to uh, welcome you here. If, um, if you guys don't know me, my name is uh, Seth Pancrath, and I have the privilege of being one of your pastors here. And uh, thank you for joining us during the season. Um, if you, on your way in, you should have gotten one of the little communion packets. If you didn't, uh, you can go grab one of those. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to sing a hymn, and uh, then we're going to have communion time after that. But um, uh, next week is 4th of July weekend, and uh, um, we would like to just have a time of fellowship. Uh, so before the service, uh, we'll, br we'll bring out the grill, cook up some hot dogs, uh, have uh, you know, some, some water and chips available, and just have a, have a time of fellowship outside before the service. Uh, we'll do it all uh, properly and with all safety precautions. Uh, but what, what time should we do that? Uh, Say about 5.30, weather permitting, okay? So 5.30, weather permitting, uh, come on out. And if you'd like to help out with that, you can see Mr. Bob Goddard. And uh, so we'll have that on a Saturday night at 5.30 and then after church um, on Sunday morning. And so either one, you can come and, and grab some fellowship time. So let's do that. Let's, uh, let's keep singing. This next song is, is called The Solid Rock. Good old hymn here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My anchor holds within the veil His oath, His covenant, His blood Support me in the whelming flood 
but when all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in Him be bound, dressed in His righteousness alone, Communion is uh, one of those uh, special uh, times and special moments for the church. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're commanded to do that we can't do as individuals, uh, really, that we're called to do this uh, when we meet together. And um, it's a reminder of, of what Christ did for us, how he unified us, how he brought us together with his blood, uh, not just with each other, but uh, with himself, with, with God. You see, we were enemies with God. Our sins separate us from him. And so we needed a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sin. And so on the night that he was betrayed, uh, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this bread is, is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so it's a reminder that, that Christ gave himself, gave his body, gave his blood as a sacrifice for us. And so we're gonna have a time of reflection. I encourage you to use this time to pray. And when you're, when you're ready, you're, feel free to take communion. Hallelujah, thank you Jesus. 
thank you for your love. We thank you that uh, uh, Christ is worthy, that he is worthy of all honor and glory. And uh, it makes us want to shout. It makes us celebrate, Lord. It makes us want to uh, share what is on the inside um, outwardly. And Lord, I pray that that would be our, our heartbeat, that would be our desire, that would be our joy. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Calvary Bible Church, I'm excited to be here to open up God's Word and see what it says for our lives. I'm excited that we can gather together in this way, whether you're physically here or whether you're watching online. My aim and my goal is for us to be transformed by the reading of his holy, infallible word. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Numbers. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 20 this, morning, or this evening, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. Numbers 20, 1 through 13. 
It says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so you shall bring water out of the rock from them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from, the, from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Let's pray. Father, you are good. You are gracious. We ask you now that you would meet with us, that you would transform our lives, that you would move us, and that you would shape us to, more, to look more and more like Jesus. We pray that you would reveal our hearts, that you would open our eyes, that you would open our minds, that you would open our ears to your word and your truth, and you would move. We love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes uh, this evening or this morning, the title of our message is called Water from a Rock, God's Unbroken Promise to an Unbelieving People. So we have landed right smack dab in the middle of the book of Numbers. There is a lot of contacts that we need to, um, you know, kind of get caught up with. And so just to give a small amount of context, by the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, the people of Israel had been walking in the wilderness now for 38 years. The original generation that witnessed the bonds of slavery to Egypt had mostly died off, and now their kids were the primary people. We know Moses to be the author of the book of Numbers, which he penned in the final years of his own life. The theme of the book of Numbers is the holiness of God, who cannot ignore rebellion, but who also keeps his covenant. Robert Frost is probably one of my favorite poets. He has penned some incredible works and wonderful poems. One of them, which is my favorite, is called The Road Not Taken. The poem is about two paths in the forest, and he has a choice. He chooses the path that is less traveled. Now, one scholar writes regarding this poem. In his poem, The Road Not Taken, Robert Frost wrote, Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. I think that there is something to be said for taking the easy route because it makes us feel safe. 
This is the scholar writing in regards to Robert Frost's poem. At the same time, I also think that there is something profound in taking road less traveled. Even if longer, windier, and more dangerous along the way, sometimes the harder we work for something, the more we appreciate what we've accomplished once we arrive at our destination. I would add that just maybe the road less traveled was so that belief could be, be, could be built in the God who chose to deliver Israel from the hands of Egypt, who brought blood from water, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, livestock, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, and darkness. That belief could be built in the God who parted the waves and water so that Israel could flee on dry ocean bottom. That belief could be built in a God that could supply water by telling Moses to strike a rock. I wish I could stand up here today and say that this is why God chose to wait 40 years before Israel was brought into the promised land. But that's just not the case. God chose to wait 40 years so that the first generation could die off due to their unbelief. In the first verse that we read, Miriam dying in the first verse, it signifies something. We know Miriam to be the one that made the celebration after the uh, going through the Red Sea. But we also know Miriam to be the one in chapter 12 to question and go against Moses, showing her unbelief in a faithful God. Her death that we see here in verse 1 served as a symbol that the old generation would not enter the promised land. If you're taking notes, I want to make it as simple as possible for you. So we are going to be looking at three sections in the text that we just read. There'll be three sections and then there'll be two applications. So we're going to jump in. The first section that we see here is the complaints of Israel. We find in verse 1, Miriam dying, which is a significant find there. It tells the reader that this first generation has walked the wilderness, that they've gone through being an unbelieving generation that had consequences because of their unbelief, and God had allowed that th this generation would not see the promised land. But we get to verse 2 through 5, and we see the complaints of Israel. The first complaint that we see, we see, first of all, that they are complaining because they want water. They desire water. And so they are at a, at a point right now where they're going up against those people that are in charge. They're going against the leadership. They're going against God himself. And they're saying, I need water. Look with me here because it's going to show us that the people wished for death. Have you been so thirsty before that you have actually wished to just die? Chapter 16 of Numbers shows Korah's rebellion. This is what the people of Israel are referring to. They're wishing in this very moment that they could too have died. Let me ask a question for us today. Why is it, and I hate to generalize, but I know my own heart, so many times in thinking about God's faithfulness in the past in my own life, if I'm thinking about something, I don't think and I don't go to the point in time where God was faithful to get me through. I don't think of that time where God supplied all of my needs and some of my wants and put me in a place where I could say, wow, God, you are faithful. You know what I think about? I think about those times where something bad happened in my life. There could be 50 good, faithful, precious moments where I see God's providence in my own life and I go to that one thing. And that one thing I dwell on. And that one thing I say, woe is me. And that one thing I wish, why are you putting me through this? Woe is me. The test is too strong. 
So why is it that we always think about the bad memories and not the good ones? If they were thinking back, why didn't they think back to the stories of of God's promises and the covenant to Israel? You see here, they could have thought about the first time that Moses was instructed to strike the rock in the first generation. They could have thought about uh, parting the, the Red Sea and walking through. They could have thought about all of that. But they chose not to. Not only that, the people wished for slavery. They wanted to be back in captivity. They wanted to be workers again. They wanted to be on a lower scale to the Egyptians. They did it all. They wished for all of that. They had that woe is me moment all for this. For a cup of water. Think about that for a moment, desiring something so much that you're willing to go into rebellion. You're willing to question the leadership that God has appointed. You're willing to wish for slavery, that you're willing to wish for even death. That's what we see here when we see the complaints of Israel. We see that the people wished for death and the people wished for slavery. But we see something in the midst of all of this unbelief and all of this complaining. We find verses 6 through 9 where we see the command of God. Now I want us to look at something really quick here. Because the command is different than what we find in Exodus chapter 17. You see in Exodus chapter 17, we see... The first generation walking through and God commands Moses to not speak but to strike. God tells Moses, go to that rock, pick up your staff and strike that rock and watch the waters flow. So maybe we could say here, wow, just maybe... In the moment of uh, Moses' nervousness, maybe the stress from the people that was quarreling against him, maybe he just got a couple words mixed up. Maybe it wasn't his unfaithfulness. Maybe it wasn't his unbelief. Well, keep that in your mind because we're going to get to that in just a moment. But I want to see that the command of God shows something. The command of God in verses 6 through 9, it shows that God shows His grace by giving water to the congregation. God, being all-knowing and all-powerful, has heard the unbelief from the congregation of Israel. He has witnessed the unbelief not only from the previous generation, but now He is faced with the same exact thing. That woe is me. And you know what he could have done? He could have let this generation die off because of their unbelief too. He could have kept them in the wilderness for 80 years instead of 40. But he doesn't. And you know what? He actually goes one step further. Not only do we see that God shows his grace by giving water to the congregation, but he shows his grace by also giving water to the cattle. We could go back in the book of Genesis where we see that humankind is the pinnacle, the pinnacle of God's creation. So he could have said, I'm going to keep my pinnacle and I'm going to give them some consequences by not keeping the least of those with their cattle. But no, God extends his grace further and further and further. And he says, not only am I going to give water to this unbelieving people that I have chosen, not only am I going to give water to this, this people that I have parted the Red Sea, I've killed off Pharaoh in the chariots, and I've let them pass through on dry ocean bottom. I have graced them with water from the rock before. I've graced them with 
good weather and manna. I have graced them with good leaders. I have graced them by being with them through this journey. I have graced them in all of this. But no, we find ourselves with an unbelieving people and God's grace. Now here is where I need to intersect. Because here we find ourselves where if I'm reading this, I am going to insert me, Colin Terenzini, as Moses or as Aaron, as some, you know, someone who is leadership, who, someone who is, who is listening to God and taking his staff and striking the rock and, and leading these people on this journey. That's what we do as the reader. But if I can be honest with you just for a moment, I wouldn't be Moses. I wouldn't be one of the ones falling on my face. You know who I would be? I would be the one quarreling against Moses. I would be the one with the unbelief. That would be me. I would be that. When I insert myself into this, I can't honestly insert myself into someone who is, is, is you know, who's leading everyone. I, no. I'm the one that's saying, woe is me. Where is my water? I need water. Why didn't I die? Why did you put me out here? Take me back to Egypt. I will be a slave there. I will be a second class citizen. That's me. The command of God shows His character. It shows how much grace and how much mercy He gives to His people. Not only do we find the complaints of Israel, and not only do we see the command of God, but stay with me for a moment. We see the, ca the carelessness or callousness of Moses. The carelessness or callousness of Moses. We find that in verse 10 through 13. A definition of callousness would be insensitive and cruel disregard for others. If you're taking notes this morning, you may want to jot this down. In verse 10 through 13 we find the story where Moses strikes the rock instead of speaks and commands the rock to pour out water. And then we have a dialogue between Moses and God. And God says, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I asked a question earlier. Well, maybe this is a second time. Maybe um, because he struck the rock before. Maybe Moses really just uh, messed up. Maybe it wasn't anything uh, personal or maybe it wasn't that serious. But when we look at verse 12, we find something. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Because you did not believe in me. The reason Moses chose to strike instead of speak was because a lack of belief. It was because this is what he's used to. This is what he's comfortable with. This is what the Lord had instructed him to do the first time. And so he goes back to something that he's comfortable with other than listening to what the Lord had told him. And because of that, there was consequences. Disbelief a lot of times leads... To disobedience. If you're taking notes, disbelief a lot of times leads to disobedience. Instead of Moses saying, he ends up striking. 
And not only do we see disbelief leads to disobedience, but we see disobedience leads to consequences. Those consequences were serious. Those consequences we find in verses 12 and 13 where it says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. That is very serious. You want to know why? Because God instructed Moses to lead these people. And Moses said, yes, send me. After a little bit of negotiation, because he had a speaking problem, he said. And he's been at this for about 40 years. Imagine walking somewhere for 40 years, your whole life essentially. And in the very last moment, in the very last finish line, in the very last day, you stumble. And because of that, you do not get to see the beauty. You don't get to see the beauty. The one whom God appointed to lead the nation of Israel was left without being able to see the promised land. If I have just a quick moment, I'd ask that you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. This is really important. And this is, if, you, if I've lost you along the way, I, I, I pray and I ask that you would circle back to me. That you would give me about 10 more minutes as we dive in to Hebrews. It says, Therefore, holy brothers... You who share in a heavenly calling consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. <clears throat> who is faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glo- glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built but someone, by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope." Let's go down to verse 16, where it says, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. Jesus is greater than Adam Jesus is greater than Noah. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater than even Moses. In the very last moment, Moses stumbled. And because of that, there were serious consequences. He wasn't able to lead the people of God into the place of God. But we find something so much different when we cling on to Jesus, when we hold fast to Jesus, which in Hebrews it tells us to. Jesus is sufficient as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Jesus is sufficient to lead us, the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, into the promised land where there will be no more tears, 
where we will find rest, where we will find a place to rejoice, where we will find no sickness, and where we, as the people of God, will be gathered as His bride to worship Him for all of the days. I think it's funny because we find something. We find something hidden in John. In John, we see something in chapter 4, verse 7. It says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. We find in a first generation of Israel... There was an unbelieving people who wanted water. And God tells Moses, strike the rock. We find in the second generation of Israel, an unbelieving people that is asking for water. Even to the point of going back to Egypt, even to the point of death. And this faithful God says to him, strike or, or command the rock this time. Don't strike the rock. Jesus gives us something that we will never thirst for anymore. He gives us himself, which is living water. And so we find ourselves that we, in Hebrews, need to hold fast to this Jesus who came to this earth, left the glories and the riches of heaven, to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, die on a cross for you and for me, raise himself by his own power, and says, call on me. I am the living water. So what do we do with this? What do we do as the church of Jesus Christ? Well, we know Hebrews was written during a time of persecution. And I'm not saying we're in a time of persecution, but I would say we're in an unusual time with uh, COVID-19 and with uh, this, this racism and, and all the tension that surrounds our communities and our nation right now. What do we do? We trust and obey. We go to the living word of God where we trust what he says and we're obedient to it. There's an old hymn that says, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. If you're here with me tonight or maybe you're watching this live stream this morning, I ask you, have you ever trust and obeyed Jesus? Before you can trust and obey Him, or before you can obey Him, you have to trust Him. And you can do that, whether it's here or whether it's in your living room. You can do that by calling on Him as Lord and Savior. Acknowledging that you are in a position where you need a Savior because of your sin. And that Jesus came to this earth, He died for you and for me. He rose by his own power for you and for me so that we could have everlasting life by trusting and obeying in this spotless lamb. Trust and obey. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are good, you are gracious, and you allow us to see in your word how to trust and how to obey. And as we bridge a gap of Hebrews to Numbers, I pray that we would hold fast to Jesus, that we would repent of our sins, that we would do a self-examination 
and that we would want to be on fire for you, for the kingdom, that we would want to be ambassadors of the gospel. So be with us now during this crazy and hectic time. Allow the bride of Christ to represent Jesus so beautifully during this time. And Father, we repent of our unbelief and we ask that you would increase our faith, that you would increase our belief. We trust in you and we ask that we would be obedient to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.